Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jenny Chang, and I'm honored to serve as your assistant host today. I'm currently a sophomore majoring in diplomacy at National Zhengzhi University. Additionally, I'm also a member of the Fairwind Youth Leadership Program. It is with immense pleasure and excitement that I have the opportunity to assist in hosting today's event, which focuses on America's grain strategy towards China. Now, please welcome Chairman Zhang to the stage for his opening remarks. Thank you. Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the forum organized by the Fairwinds Foundation and the KT Lee Foundation. Um, the topic of today's forum is America's grand strategy toward China. I think the importance of the topic is so manifest that I do not need uh, to explain uh, the reason why we are going to have this event. Um, it is our great honor to have three distinguished speakers today to share their views on this issue. Uh, two of the members uh, are part of the air delegation which visited Beijing last week and came to Taiwan a few days ago. Uh, the Yale delegation comprised of um, senior faculties, former government practitioners, and a special group of talented students from Yale. So um, may I invite all of our audience to welcome the Yale delegation with your big hands. <laughs> now, as the moderator of the forum, I would like to uh, introduce the three distinguished speakers first. Uh, our first speaker is Mr. Edward Winterstein, uh, Ted. Ted is the leader of the Yale delegation. Uh, he is also the executive director of international security study at the Yale Jackson School of Global Affairs. In that capacity, Ted helped oversee a number of programs dedicated to international history and the global security, including the Schmidt Program on Artificial Intelligence, Emerging Technologies, and the National Power, the Johnson Center for the Study of American Diplomacy, and the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy. Ted is also a graduate of Yale College and the Yale Law School. Before returning to work at Yale, he held a variety of positions at the United States government including the Department of Defense Commission on the Intelligence Capabilities of the United States regarding weapons of mass destruction, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence under the Department of State. I want to thank Ted for accepting our invitation and to speak at the forum. Our second speaker is Mr. David Rank. David is also a senior fellow at the Yale Jackson School of Global, Stale, uh, Global Affairs, and he is also the head of China practice at the Cohen Group. David spent 27 years uh, at the State Department of Foreign Service Office, including his final assignment as the Deputy Chief of Mission and the Acting Ambassador at the United States Embassy in Beijing. He worked in many, many countries, including China, Greece, Afghanistan, and Taiwan. He actually worked at the AIT for six years. I just asked him. Um, <laughs> he can speak a very good Mandarin Chinese. Uh, in addition to his diplomatic service, David also teach at the Johns Hopkins University, and he is also a senior fellow at the University of Chicago. Uh, welcome to join the forum too. <laughs> our third speaker is our old uh, good friend, Dr. Su Qi. Su Qi is the chairman of Taipei Forum. He is also the honorary professor at the National Zhengzhi University. He earned his PhD in political science from Columbia University, and then he uh, served in the central government of Taiwan for many, many years, including uh, the job of the chairman of Mainland Affairs Council, uh, legislator at the legislative Yen, 
and uh, the Secretary General of National Security Council. I would like to uh, say thanks to uh, Su Qi uh, because he just uh, recently published his new book, and I think he can elaborate some of the major points of his uh, insight of the book. So um, that is the uh, sh very short introduction of our three speakers. Now, the procedure of today's forum will be like the following. Uh, each speaker will, spend, uh, will speak for about 20 minutes. Then I, will, I would like to ask a couple of questions to them or ask them to comment on each other. Then we will open the floor to all our audience. Now, uh, why don't we uh, start with our first speaker, Ted. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, in addition uh, to all of your outstanding public service uh, in Taiwan and the outstanding work you do at this foundation, maybe not everyone knows that you are also an alumnus of Yale University. So we have one of our distinguished uh, Yale University alums uh, received a PhD in political science. Uh, and Yale University just trains leaders across every field of endeavor, and uh, you are a wonderful example of that. So it's delightful uh, to be here, and thank you to the Fairwinds Foundation uh, for hosting us. I believe this is the largest Yale University delegation that we have ever brought uh, to ta Taiwan. Uh, in addition to Ambassador Rank and I, I'm joined by a number of other faculty colleagues uh, and students who should raise their hands. These are students uh, in my own class. Uh, <laughs> many of whom uh, are, also, are visiting Taiwan for the first time. Uh, I was last in Taiwan uh, in July. I was last in uh, Beijing also in July. Uh, before that, though, uh, of course, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, most people had not been uh, in Asia. Most US persons had not traveled in Asia for four years. Uh, so I was last in China, in mainland China, in November of 2019. Uh, when Dr. Henry Kissinger visited China right before uh, the pandemic. And so I think this sort of lack of people-to-people -people connections has really uh, accelerated a pretty dramatic decline uh, that we witnessed in U.S.-China relations uh, during COVID. And I think this is partly uh, what has contributed to kind of the downfall in tensions in U.S.-China relations. But the fundamental challenges were always there. And I think it has really just been a question of the speed of decline. And Ambassador Rank, uh, when he talks, can speak to just how many decades of experience he has seen in, in the ups and downs uh, in US-China relations. So it is a pleasure to be here. As noted, uh, we were in Beijing uh, for four days prior to arrival in Taiwan. So our delegation uh, engaged in an exchange with Renmin University of China on challenges in U.S.-China relations, in particular the role that emerging technologies have played in creating significant tensions in the relationship. I'll say a little bit about that uh, during my remarks. And then, of course, Ambassador Rank and I also had an opportunity to meet uh, with a number of former senior uh, military and foreign policy and political uh, leaders in China as well uh, before our travel here uh, to Taiwan. When uh, President Biden gave his big State of the Union address uh, last week. He said that he, uh, I want competition with China, but not conflict. So if I was going to sum up what I think the US strategy at the moment is with respect to China, it would be this phrase, uh, competition without conflict. But that's an easy phrase to say, and it's a very difficult phrase to practice in reality. And so what I might try to do is say a little bit about what I think this competition without conflict phrase means and why it has been uh, difficult uh, for the United States and China uh, to define this current contest in relations as well as its impact on cross-strait relations and, and uh, meaning for U.S.-Taiwan uh, ties. When I was in Beijing in July, I would say that was the low point of U.S.-China relations that I had personally witnessed in my lifetime. Dr. Kissinger had said at that time that he believed the United States and China were, uh, quote, on the foothills of a Cold War. Uh, and we are in a little bit of a more steady state since then. In July, we were in the aftermath uh, of this U.S. spy balloon incident. Some might remember 
this surveillance balloon that was floating over parts of the American homeland uh, and a canceled trip by the U.S. Secretary of State Blinken uh, to China in the aftermath. There was a very aggressive period of U.S. diplomacy since that time. It involved travel of senior U.S. officials to China, uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury Janet Yellen, um, Dr. Kissinger himself uh, returned to China uh, on the occasion of his 100th birthday uh, before passing uh, away. And I think there really was an effort to try to restabilize relations, which culminated in the so-called Woodside Summit, the APEC Summit in San Francisco between President Biden and President Xi Jinping. And I think there was a, a sentiment reached uh, at that time that it was better to engage than not engage, not because there would be fundamental breakthroughs in U.S.-China relations, but going back to a period of non-engagement, not even talking, no human interaction, uh, would make the situation worse. Uh, that the likelihood for miscalculation or inadvertent conflict would increase in the event of a complete disentanglement of people-to-people -people exchange. So there were four areas of agreement uh, at this Woodside Summit, which the United States and China have been working on rather aggressively since that time. Uh, the first area where I think the United States and China have actually made the most progress is on counter-narcotics cooperation. So some here might be familiar with the fentanyl crisis in the United States, the precursor chemicals for this very dangerous drug often originate in China, and this is something uh, that both governments have been working on. So it does show, I think, that on areas of mutual interest, there are uh, ways that the United States and China can continue to engage and hopefully uh, result in better outcomes uh, for future generations. The resumption of military to military ties was the sort of second outgrowth of this Woodside Summit. And here there has also been some progress. There's a resumption of, of talks between senior military officials and there are a number of uh, track two dialogues and exchanges among senior officials, former senior officials uh, in the military and intelligence sphere. And again, this is not to result in any fundamental breakthroughs or understandings about our different militaries and objectives, but to create hopefully some greater understanding and transparency in terms of strategy, doctrine, movements in contested areas to prevent an accident uh, that might escalate in, in inadvertent ways. The third area, which was part of what originally brought my students here to China, uh, is uh, artificial intelligence and discussions surrounding questions of AI safety and security and the need for government and hopefully private sector talks between the United States and China on this area. Uh, and my students were actually engaging in a debate with their Chinese student counterparts on U.S.-China relations and the role of artificial intelligence uh, and technologies in the relationship. Those talks uh, are supposed to take place this spring, uh, although uh, a date has not yet been set. Uh, but again, I think it shows a recognition by both the United States and China that AI has a potential transformational impact on U.S.-China relations and the world. It's really a fundamental technology that will affect almost every field of endeavor. So it's similar to electricity uh, or it's similar uh, to other fundamental uh, tools that all humans uh, use. And so because of that, it's exacerbating a number of tensions in U.S.-China relations, particularly related to areas of uh, surveillance, potential military applications, uh, disinformation, cognitive warfare, ways to manipulate public opinion using these AI tools. Uh, we've seen this TikTok debate in the United States about questions of data between the two countries and the extent to which we should be governed by U.S. or Chinese laws and the purposes uh, of these AI tools. So this has risen pretty high uh, in the in the. Uh, along the scale of U.S.-China relations, and it has done that very quickly. For someone uh, who has followed U.S.-China relations for a number of years, Ambassador David Rank for much longer than me, 
I've been surprised how quickly AI and emerging technologies have kind of risen up the ladder uh, of the top core issues uh, in the relationship. So we can say more about AI and technology maybe during discussion, but I'll just flag this as an area uh, of recognition about AI safety and security risks. Uh, again, I am not optimistic that these talks and dialogue will lead to some miraculous breakthrough in the short term, but the goal is to start the conversation, uh, to define the problem, to think about where uh, there are areas uh, of shared risk and opportunity, uh, or at least where there could be f understandings that could prevent miscalculation or inadvertent conflict. The challenge, of course, in this area is that the technology is dual use, right? So any AI benefit potentially has a malicious use, and it might depend on the intent or the ethics uh, of the user. So the extent that there's a fundamental breakdown in trust between the United States and China, to the extent that there's a lack uh, of shared values given our competing systems of governance, that is very likely to be exacerbated uh, by these technical tools, and that, I think, is what's fomenting a lot of the current U.S.-China tensions in this area. But we'll see how these AI talks uh, progress in the spring. So that was the third outcome uh, of this Woodside summit between Biden and Xi. The fourth area uh, was sort of rebooted people-to-people uh, -people, uh, flights, exchanges, uh, interactions among students, opportunities for students and business people uh, to travel more easily between both the United States and China. I was shocked when I was here in July just how few Americans were left in China. So uh, for those of us who have traveled there uh, before, the numbers were so high. It was such a large community uh, of students and scholars and business people in China. Uh, that has had plummeted. By July, the numbers were down to uh, around 100 U.S. students, 100, uh, down from many, many thousands prior to that. The numbers are at about 350 or so now. That's still very low, uh, given the size uh, of China. It has been a slight bump. Uh, again, all the challenges that I've mentioned so far are generational challenges, right? It's, so it's going to be very important to get young people uh, engaged in these areas. Uh, and so this is why I think there is a recognition uh, both between the U.S. and China that our students need to engage. So this exchange program that my students were involved in in China, that was really the first exchange of its sort that my university had had with China uh, in a period of at least five years. So that has to change. So again, uh, we need that exchange in order uh, to create better understanding. Whether it will truly lead to trust or fundamental differences, I am less optimistic about. But I think the point is uh, a world where we were completely divided, completely decoupled, completely de-risked uh, across all fields of interaction would be a world that is more likely to see conflict between the United States and China, not less likely to see conflict. So the United States and China are in the process of, of trying to uh, put a positive spin on the relationship and stabilize relations since this APEC summit. Um, I want to say a little bit about uh, Taiwan uh, and implications for cross-state relations before handing it over to my colleagues. I was struck and very concerned when I was in mainland China uh, about uh, this talk uh, of the Taiwan issue uh, not being put off to future generations. So we've seen statements from Chinese leaders to this effect. Again, not giving specific timetables of conflict. I, I am less uh, worried about sp some of the specific dates that have maybe been uh, thrown around in the news. But I think the sentiment among Chinese leaders, mainland leaders, is that uh, they do not wish to pass this challenge down to uh, the next generation. Whereas I am eager to get our next generation involved in these issues, it's not as clear to me that in the Chinese system uh, they believe this issue should be passed on. And of course the One China policy that Dr. Kissinger originally helped negotiate was, was designed to buy space and to buy time. 
uh, in hopes that there would be a peaceful resolution or understanding uh, of the question uh, to the benefit uh, of everyone. So the extent to which we are no longer willing uh, to wait, uh, I think, is going to be uh, a question. It's not clear uh, what the impact of the economic situation is. So and one thing that really struck me about my time in Beijing is how much concern and openness there is about negative uh, decline in the Chinese economy. So students, professors, uh, senior government officials, um, cab drivers, people are willing to tell you uh, that the economic situation is not good in China, that there are uh, reasons for concern, that they don't believe the government figures uh, in terms of economic growth and impact. So there's a lot of unease in China, uh, and I think it's important to think about what that might mean for cross-strait relations. So does that uh, mean the cross-strait question uh, will get pushed off because people are more focused on internal political questions and stability? I think the economic situation is a real potential crisis for the Chinese leadership. They've made the case for all of these years that uh, the Chinese story, the benefit of China, is the economic performance that they've delivered. Uh, the communism, uh, but com combination of communist ideology and authoritarian government with innovation and entrepreneurship. That that's been the good news story of China. But to the extent to which the economic situation declines or doesn't deliver as much as it should, I think that raises some real legitimacy questions for the Chinese government. So there's a question here about whether there'll be more domestic focus and less external focus. But of course, that can cut both ways for Taiwan, right? So the extent that external uh, issues become an excuse or a way to create distraction or a way to sort of puff up uh, the strength of a government or a military, this is something that I'm worried about uh, and watching carefully. So the United States is engaged uh, with its partners uh, in the region to counter you know, this challenge that China poses. Uh, and it, what China has sought to do is project power and influence and impose its system uh, of governance and values uh, on a number of countries and partners in this area of the world. And the United States you know, rejects and opposes efforts to unilaterally alter the status quo. And it will continue to do that. But it's hard to do. And we'll get into some areas where conflict may be more uh, or less likely. The other challenge with grand strategy, of course, is you know the United States has a political system and cycle, uh, including our upcoming election. And that does not uh, make it easy to articulate long-term plans. So uh, whoever wins the presidential election might uh, wish to pursue a different approach. Uh, the U.S. Congress uh, has another interest, set of interests that might differ uh, from the presidency. Uh, in Taiwan, you're not uh, unfamiliar to the challenges of divided government, right? So uh, to the extent that one party controls some areas of the government and one party controls the legislature, this, this makes strategy very difficult. And the inclination is to score political points domestically. And when there are divided and polarized internal governments, it's very hard to project uh, power and influence abroad uh, and to articulate foreign policy. And so this is what China, I think, is banking on. Despite the facts that its own system is very vulnerable uh, at the moment because of the economic situation, it's hoping that democracies will prove even more vulnerable and more dysfunctional. So China would love a world where the United States and Taiwan are so wrapped up in our internal governance problems that we're unable to really focus uh, and focus clearly uh, on the geopolitical and strategic and uh, security challenges that China poses in the world. So uh, I'll stop there for now, except just to say uh, I'm very grateful to be here and to be part of this conversation, and I'm looking forward to the questions and comments from my colleagues. So thank you very much. Uh, especially um, 
the part about that you are visited in uh, Beijing. I think that is very, very valuable to all our audience. Now, uh, Dave, would you like to uh, say something about this topic? Sure. Thank you, Premier Jiang. Uh, and thanks to the board of the Fairwinds Foundation. <clears throat> I'm afraid I, I'm going to have to disappoint you. And for those of you in the audience who can't see her, there's a woman a, a, a few rows back with a little sign uh, that she'll hold up that says, five minutes left. <laughs> and I'm going to disappoint her, too, because I don't think I have 20 minutes to add to what Ted has just said. But uh, I, uh, you know, when I was in government, I would come to events like this, and my staff would push into my hands a, a stack of papers with very clear positions where I had to make sure I said everything that was on there and didn't say anything that wasn't on there. <laughs> and I got very good at that. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is I have to do it myself. Uh, but uh, fortunately for you all, I will be much uh, uh, shorter for it. Uh, I was tempted when you invited me to come up here and speak on uh, U.S. grand strategy towards China uh, to give the same answer that uh, Prime Minister Nehru of India gave uh, when he was asked his view on Western civilization, uh, and his response was that he thought it would be a good idea. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, be, as, as Ted, you said, uh, you know, the U.S. political discussions and the domestic uh, arguments uh, in our own political system uh, uh, overtake, uh, you know, the, the broader view that the United States has, uh, even on foreign policy issues. Uh, that is probably less the case with China uh, uh, than on other issues. And in fact, there's probably, to the extent there is consensus on anything uh, in Washington right now, uh, uh, the general assessment of the challenge China faces is, is probably one of those rare places uh, that there is consensus. Uh, I thought I'd give a little bit of con uh, context to uh, what, Ted, you talked about, uh, you know, the views on China and the background, the historical background uh, of the U.S.-China relationship. I've been coming and going uh, uh, to China for the past 30 years. I was an American diplomat for 30 years. Uh, and uh, starting in 1990, in other words, a year after the Tiananmen Massacre, I arrived in, in China for my first assignment, uh, and I left uh, shortly after the start of the Trump administration uh, in 2017. And over that time, uh, uh, we saw a lot of ups and a lot of downs in the relationship. Uh, uh, the United States was inst instrumental in bringing, uh, uh, admitting China into the World Trade Organization. Uh, th we saw lots and lots of cooperation across a range of uh, international issues, but we also had some real crises in the uh, in the relationship, uh, including uh, I happened to be in, in Beijing when we accidentally blew up the Chinese embassy uh, in Yugoslavia. Uh, I was there when the Chinese accidentally a Chinese pilot accidentally knocked down an American plane over the South China Sea. And so we've been through very difficult moments uh, in the past. Uh, what's different now, I think, is that there is less, uh, and, and Ted, you got into it, there is less uh, uh, binding the relationship together. So if we were to have another one of those incidents uh, that we had in the, the early 2000s, uh, I think it would be a much more serious uh, crisis than we faced then. Uh, and a little more context, uh, again, I, I was uh, the senior career diplomat in our embassy at the end of the Obama administration, uh, and I, which I think uh, really the high point of U.S. efforts to engage China, to influence Chinese behavior, uh, and to uh, integrate what we uh, said then was to integrate China into the rules-based uh, uh, order. Uh, and perspective I take to that effort, and, and ultimately I think Barack Obama uh, left office frustrated with those efforts. Uh, I spent five years uh, in the, during the Obama administration working, on, uh, working in Afghanistan and then back in Washington uh, on Afghan policy. Uh, the United States invested 20 years, probably a trillion dollars, lost more than 2,000 servicemen uh, in Afghanistan fighting. 
Uh, and at the end of that time, at the end of having invested the, the time and resources and blood, uh, our impact on Afghan, uh, the direction of that country was fairly limited. And I, I, I like to use that uh, and think about how much less influence we have over the People's Republic of China, uh, you know, to put in context the effort to shape Chinese behavior. Not that China doesn't respond to outside uh, stimuli, to outside uh, pressure, uh, but it's just much, much harder. And so I, I think there's consensus now in Washington that a China strategy, uh, uh, China is the end of a China strategy rather than the beginning of a China strategy. Because the, the country over which we have the most influence is the United States. And so that's where our strategy has to start uh, with investing in uh, economically in areas that, that make the United States more uh, competitive, uh, reinforcing our uh, democratic uh, structure and systems, building up a labor force uh, that has been really uh, uh, badly hit by uh, uh, deindustrialization. Uh, not entirely, but uh, at least I in a significant uh, part because of the competition, in many cases, competition uh, 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 supported by uh, large non-market uh, support from PRs, from the, the Chinese government, uh, has really uh, damaged the U.S. industrial economy. And so that's the first part of the U.S. strategy. Uh, the second part uh, of uh, the U.S. approach to China is to look not to China, but to our allies in the region and globally, and reinforce uh, uh, and restore uh, those relationships, not as an effort to contain China, uh, but to strengthen the uh, uh, the will and the resolve uh, and the confidence that free market democracies around around the world have. And then and only then uh, do we, having shored up our, our position at home and with our allies and partners, uh, do we engage with China uh, and in the recognition uh, that there are some things that uh, uh, we can't change. Uh, and I think increasingly you'll see the United States saying, while we may not be able to, uh, uh, you know, decades now of, of, say, trade negotiations uh, have, have failed to limit non-market practices uh, by the Chinese. And that may, we may just have to accept that, but that does not mean we have to accept pro products produced uh, by non-market practices into the United, uh, U.S. market or products of forced labor. Uh, we don't have to admit those into the U.S. market. And so I think increasingly uh, it will be uh, uh, not confrontational, but just a recognition of the fact that China and the United States and, uh, uh, and a lot of U.S. partners are moving in a different direction. Uh, and uh, probably in the best interests of both sides uh, to recognize that, uh, and not decouple, uh, but to where we cannot see eye to eye uh, uh, to move in different directions. Uh, Ted, you talked a lot about Taiwan, and, and uh, Mr. Premier, I know we'll talk about uh, Taiwan issues in our yeah, in the question and answer period. Uh, so I don't want to get too deeply into that, other than uh, as as Ted, you noted. Uh, Xi Jinping, when he wakes up, has a lot of things on his to-do list. I think uh, our goal as the United States uh, and Taiwan uh, is to the extent possible keep Taiwan off of uh, Xi Jinping's to-do list uh, uh, and, and let him deal uh, with the many, many other headaches he has. So I think I have disappointed your assistant and her five-minute sign, but I will turn it back to you, Mr. Premier. Thank you. All right. We can save the time for more conversation and uh, questions. Okay, uh, our third speaker will be uh, Dr. Su Qi, and uh, Su Qi, you can um, either make your own uh, statement or ask some question to the two okay. previous speakers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Zhang, for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful, and also I'd like to thank David for giving more more time. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I. I uh, I prepared uh, not just one page, but three pages. Uh, anyway, I'm privileged to be here, and uh, the topic today at hand is, I think, the most important, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the most important uh, uh, topic for today, because U.S. is still the superpower, the sole superpower, and the most important driver of the world politics. Uh, Donald Trump. Uh, initiated 
trade war with China and everything, everything changed the same way. So Taiwan should study more uh, U.S. grand strategy. We should pay more attention to U.S.-China relations than cross-strait relations. Uh, in Taiwan, I think we, 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 we got it reverse. Anyway, uh, I'd like to uh, make four points which uh, some of my American friends may not find too palatable. Uh, I consider myself a friend of the U.S. I studied and lived in the U.S. for a good 10 years. And uh, in the last four years, when I started teaching in Taiwan, I, I continued to engage uh, Americans in government and academia, and think tanks, and, and all that. But uh, I, um, I have some trouble. I have four troubles uh, with the uh, American grant strategy today. So I'll, I'll, I'll lay them out for your consideration. The first one uh, is, I think, uh, America grants, there's, a, there's a, a relatively weak intellectual foundation of the current grant strategy in Washington, compared with the previous one vis-a-vis -vis Soviet Union. Uh, NSC 68, um, some of you may have heard of it, it was, it was intellectually sound uh, and well prepared, and it turned out to be, uh, you know, it paved the way for, for containment policy, which proved to be correct and successful for the United States. But this time, the uh, U.S. strategy toward China struck me as more extemporaneous in nature. It was not prepared well thought out, hashed, well hashed ahead of time. And uh, hastily, State Department put together a China House. Uh, hastily, the Congress put together a special committee on China. I mean, I mean you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's, in my view, in my, uh, as, as an outsider looking inside, I, 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 I don't think, I don't think, uh, Washington was, was really prepared. And uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll give you, one, I'll give you one, 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 uh, one example to prove my point. Actually, I, I, think, I think this point in time, uh, this is uh, 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 the US-China relations is, as I said, the most important bilateral relation in the world. And it just happens that neither China nor US has any experience in dealing with each, the other side as a peer. China, for centuries and centuries, was the greatest power in the world. U.S. was not there. When U.S. was here as the superpower, China was poor, weak, and divided, and backward. So now, all of a sudden, China becomes a peer, and U.S. has to face China, and China has to deal with the U.S. Neither has any experience in dealing with each other on e on equal basis or, or, or you know, as a, as a peer competitor. So at this point in time, if I were American government, in, in, official in the government, I would, I would die to recruit as many China specialists as possible into the, gov gov the policy making. And yet, uh, at least from what I heard from my American friends in and out of government, that the China specialists are basically sidelined, side, China especially in the U.S., are basically sidelined, silenced, or apathetic. Uh, it's, it's, it's not good. It's not good. So what's left in the government, uh, of course, I'm not saying that no specialists are there. Still, there are still some very good, very, very solid people are working in the government and uh, doing the, the thinking. But oh, I'm saying that there, there's, there's probably not enough. And what's left there are basically uh, one type of thinking. So, so the, the, group, the de decision making in Washington DC, I'm afraid, is something like what we studied in the, in the graduate school in the US, it's called groupthink. Groupthink, we all think alike. We all think alike. And there's no challengers uh, I internally. So I think, US, I think for the U.S. to uh, 
uh, to to you know to the, the strat to design a good policy, they really need to hear all sides. And I, I just give you one example. I'll give you one example. I was surprised. I was surprised when I read, uh, uh, you know, uh, okay, let me put it this way. In the 90s, in the 1990s, <coughs> Taiwan went through democratization, and, uh, and the U.S. supported, the U.S. hoped to, uh, you, were, you were here, David, uh, and, and the U.S. hoped to, uh, you know, uh, use Taiwan to influence China, to change China from inside. And Taiwan, myself included, we totally agree. Most of the people in Taiwan, like myself, we agree that Taiwan's democracy was a good thing. And yes, Taiwan should try to help democratize China and making their life better, make people feel, breathe freer. That was the thinking in the 1990s. And yet, uh, after 2000, when we began to travel uh, China en masse and frequently more frequently than before. I, at least I began to realize, and many of my, my colleagues also felt the same way. We began, wait a minute, China is a different country. I mean, based on our understanding of Chinese history, society and culture and all that, it's impossible for China to, to go down the path of Western democracy. And much less possible for, for US to turn China into democracy, and much, much less for Taiwan as the little, little guy to change China. So we came to that realization uh, in year, I mean, uh, somewhere for me, year uh, two, between 2000 and 2010. And yet my, I, I kept telling American friends that, that, wait a minute, you got to think about this uh, assumption. China is too big and too proud to follow Western road of democracy. And you got to rethink this is the, if this is the basic of your policy, you got to rethink. And uh, nobody listened. Nobody listened. And then uh, I think the current uh, policy grand strategy stemmed from uh, an article in Foreign Affairs, uh, Kirk Campbell, my good friend, who is now the Deputy Secretary of State, and Eli Ratner, uh, who's important man, VIP in uh, Pentagon. So they wrote an article in 20, 2018. And, uh, and they argue that uh, Thai, uh, China, uh, I mean, U.S. was misled by, by China, misled by China, uh, that China made U.S. think that China would go democracy, economic growth will lead automatically to democratization. And uh, we, U.S. was wrong, and China was too sinister to do that. And I, I think, I think, uh, the U.S. is also partly to blame. Uh, U.S. should have understood after all these years of interchange between between Yale and uh, my 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 Ottomana, uh, Colombia, and we all should realize that China is too big and too proud to be Western democratic. And uh, Arab Spring failed, and why should China succeed? And particularly, particularly. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, where's my, yeah, so, so particularly uh, U.S. realized that too late, at least 10 years later than what we in Taiwan have, came to the, have come to the conclusion. And so U.S. did not redress itself until it's too late, until it's too late. So after that, overreacted to this misperception, partly created by itself. So this, I think, has to do with weak intellectual foundation of US uh, decision making. My second point has to do with mis overreading of China's ambition. Overreading of China's ambition. Uh, sure, China is ambi ambitious, no doubt about it. Of course, Xi Jinping is ambitious uh, more so than before. Uh, other previous leaders, of no doubt about it, but its ambitions are still limited. I think uh, China and Xi Jinping does have ambitious toward, ambition toward Taiwan, and does have ambition toward the South China Sea. I have no doubt on this too, but I have big question mark on East China Sea. 
I don't think China is really uh, ready or they, they, they really want to, to solve the, the Senkaku Diaoyutai issue uh, in the near future, and much less to extend it, it, its uh, influence far beyond the borders. What they have in mind now is secure the, the national boundaries, Ch Taiwan and uh, South China Sea. South China Sea for the PRA, mostly. Uh, but but, uh, but uh, many hawks in the US tend to argue that that this is uh, China's ambition is, is you know, the uh, one belt, one road is the, the best proof of Xi Jinping's ambition, uh, which uh, I also uh, find it uh, uh, disagreeable because I happen to have uh, come across an, a, piece, a speech by uh, John Thornton, John Thornton. Uh, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs CEO, formerly, and uh, uh, very active with uh, Brookings uh, Think Tank. And he talked, he spoke in a speech. Uh, he said, uh, he said he, he related a story by uh, John Kerry, uh, Secretary of State at the time. John Kerry visited uh, Beijing in 2013, or in spring, I believe. Uh, not long after he he, he got a, he got a job, and Xi Jinping was about to uh, announce his uh, one bell one road, so he sat down with with uh, John Kerry. He laid out the map. He told John Kerry that this this is what I'm going to do. We have studied for some time. We want one belt goes this way, one road goes this way, and we're going to do we're going to do this to to help the the the, the you know other countries build infrastructure. Why don't U.S. and China do it together? That's his proposal to Jiang Kerry. Why don't we do it together? So Jiang Kerry took it back home. He held a uh, uh, interagency consultation meeting. I don't know who, who were there. But anyway, according to uh, Jiang Thornton, Kerry told Thornton later that it was too bad. Uh, the idea was killed in the interagency discussion. So the idea never went up to President Obama. And I could understand why uh, U.S. Uh, uh, departments came to that decision, because U.S. didn't want China to share the, you know, U.S. US want to be the, 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 the leader, and I don't want to share the, uh, the, um, the glory with you. I don't want to be seen as as equal to China. So your project is your project, and not mine. I don't want to join you. I could I see that, but to deny this idea, to deny this China's decline the in invitation is one thing, but to argue for the American hawks to argue that this proves that China is expansionist. They want to do it. They want to extend. They want to dip their fingers in Africa and uh, and uh, Central Central America and, and everything. And I think that's an overstretch. That's an overstretch. This is overreading of China's ambition. I don't think China had that ambition. They ha they don't want to turn them into communist system or socialist system. They don't want. To, they didn't interfere in it. Their 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 uh, their policy making. They just want to make friends and make money and make money, and, and resources, of course. Resources, everybody wants resources. So I, I think my, my second problem with the American strat strategy is over-reading of China's ambition. It, there, it, there, are, there are ambitions, but not, but not, as, as, not as dark uh, as the, uh, some cocks in the US describe. And my third point has to do with the uh, with misreading of Taiwan. Misreading of Taiwan. Uh, two two things I can I can only I can mention quite a few, but I, I'll, I'll just briefly mention two things. One is one is democracy. Taiwan Taiwan is so uh, I can understand because compared with China, uh, Taiwan's democracy is a shining beauty, and uh, 
lauded by every every president, every every official, especially every member of the Congress, uh, as full democracy, vibrant democracy. Unfortunately, in my view, as someone living here and uh, gone through the last 30 years and uh, studied democracy theory and other other democracies in other countries and all that, I think Taiwan is only half democracy. Half, not full, half. Yes, we do elect our presidents, but the presidents, as I put in my book, our, president, our presidents are elected kings and queens. <laughs> They're not president. Because, because the king and queen, or queen can appoint and fire anyone without consultation with anyone or confirmation by anyone. He can, he or she can do anything. Policy, yes, the, the president can do anything without legislature uh, approval. And, and, and most beautiful of all is the president doesn't have to answer questions. In the US, Biden has to give press conference every two weeks. And, uh, and we see Biden all the time on TV. And uh, Japanese, Premier, uh, British Premier, and uh, European, uh, everybody has to go to Parliament uh, and debate with their colleagues or, or hold press conferences. And guess what? I mean, we, we all know in Taiwan, our president, President Tsai, never, rarely appeared in press conferences. And the longest record was 740 days without going one single press conference. And when she did, it was single issue conference. I'm going to appoint David Rank as my premier for that conference. And no question asked about other issues, only this one. And she gave interviews to, she gave interviews to CNN, BBC, and uh, you, you name it, uh, uh, Fox, and, uh, and, and no interviews with Taiwan media outlets, except a radio host, Zhou Yuko. That's the only exception for eight years. So, and she doesn't have to appear in parliament. In other words, we have, we, we, we have so many, Taiwan has so many, you know, we're, people are talking about existential threat, and we have no one to ask. We have no one to ask. She's a, she's a queen, uh, hidden in a palace. Uh, and so within the four years and eight years, the king or queen can do anything. This is not, this is not her fault, this is Li Denghui's fault because she designed it that way. But she really pushed to the extreme. And Americans didn't know, because this is all, this is all domestic politics, and they, they love Taiwan because they hate China. So they, they blow it up. And this influenced their, their thinking. I think tilted their thinking in the wrong way. And the second misperception by US is Taiwan's a will to fight. Uh, ask yourself, ask your younger siblings and uh, friends and if they want to fight at the beach or in the towns and cities or in the mountains. I, I doubt anyone. But, but our government produces uh, polls which show that 70% of people are willing to fight. Uh, that's a joke. But Amer Americans don't know that because, uh, because, because people just don't come here and uh, talk to... Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, saying this, I'm saying this with uh, a sad note because uh, when we were in government, when I was in government either, uh, especially in National Security Council, and I told uh, my friends in foreign, foreign ministry uh, foreign minister and other minister, I said, please, if foreigners come to Taiwan, arrange for them to visit DPP people. Because we are a democracy, our friends from abroad, they, this is probably the only time they would ever come to Taiwan. They need to see all sides. They need to hear all sides. So KMT in power did not monopolize the access to foreign visitors. But in the last eight years, believe me, uh, many of my American friends approached me 
in private only. And some would complain, how Su Chi, last time I was here, how come you refused to see me? I said, wait a minute, I didn't know you were here. You were here? And they said, they, he said, the, mini, the foreign ministry said you were too busy to see us. I said, wait a minute, I mean, no, nobody, uh, nobody told me about this business. So DPP administration blocked all the KMT, blocked the foreign visitors from contacting with KMT people like me and others. Uh, they would symbolically arrange to see the chairman. Okay, maybe that's it, and that's it, that's it. And no people like us. This, this is, this is uh, I think this led to gross misunderstanding by American friends of the real picture in Taiwan. And, uh, and uh, if U.S. continue to believe that Taiwan people have strong will to fight as strongly as the Ukrainians, I think they're, they're making a big mistake and a courting disaster for, for us all. Uh, so I, my argument is that I think China, I think Taiwan, Taiwan should, uh, as a democracy, we should uh, take up a responsibility our own. Uh, I don't know if you agree with me. Uh, Taiwan, Taiwan has a, um, Taiwan uh, right now can neither fight nor talk. Can neither fight nor talk. I don't want to go into detail. And I think Taiwan should try to make an effort to talk with China. And this would not only bring a, a better res political, uh, political result for Taiwan, but also reduce the burden on U.S. It, because the way, the way it is, Taiwan is entirely depend on the U.S. for our security. And I think Taiwan should share that responsibility. And uh, and uh, by 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 doing that, we we can we can we can truly prove that democracy uh, democracy works. So I would argue. I hope that uh, U.S. Uh, in U.S. in uh, pursuing competition with China would uh, would uh, adopt a new element that is minus Taiwan, minus Taiwan. In other words. Don't add on Taiwan. Add on Taiwan. Taiwan is the most sensible part of the U.S.-China competition, and most likely to lead to military conflict. That Taiwan gets everybody nervous. But if we somehow defuse Taiwan by encouraging Taiwan to talk with China, U.S. and China, China also will sigh great relief, which is good for us all. That's my third point. I'm sorry, time is up, but I'll use David's time. <laughs> the, the, the fourth point, uh, quickly, fourth point is, uh, is about U.S. I think U.S. also, uh, may, maybe this is your, your domestic party, I don't want to go in too much, but I, I, I think maybe, maybe you want to, maybe Ameri my American friends want to think about reorientation of the U.S. policy, because I believe the, 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 the great powers, uh, the rise and fall of the great powers uh, stem from mostly I internal factors, not external factors. You look at Rome, you look at Chinese dynasties, every single one of them, you look at Greece, you look at all the his, his, historical uh, you know, uh, empires, every single one of them fell mostly on internal affairs. So U.S. U.S. Uh, I'm not saying I'm, I'm agree with Donald Trump, make America great, great again. But what I'm saying is that more greater attention should be paid to, to internal affairs, the, to, to the to the to the income inequality, the racial tension. Yeah, the 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 white the white people was uh, the white people now is only 58 percent of the total population. And I know the, the many, many uh, white people are very nervous. The poor, the Donald Trump, uh, you know, uh, feed on this, this anxiety. And, and, and I, I think the uh, U.S. Uh, should, elites should work on some, something on, on that. And, and again, the example, the, I, I'll give you one example on each, each point. This example is immigration policy. I think U.S. immigration policy uh, it, it's maybe too late to talk about that now, but immigration is the most important 
uh, uh, point point of contention in, in the U.S. now. Uh, you uh, you uh, uh, remember the uh, uh, Mexico and uh, Central American countries? Their total population together is one half of the entire U.S. One point five billion people, and uh, I'm sorry, 150 billion, 150 million people. So, so it's one half. So, I think U.S. policy toward toward its neighbors in, to the south has been basically one of benign neglect. You're there, but now you, you're not there. I think U.S. government immigration policy and the the rich people, the industries, the companies, they should spend more money and energy on their neighbors to the south. Give them jobs, create factories, and they'll be happy there in their homeland. They don't want to come to the, to the US. They don't want to come to the US. So that, 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 that's, 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 the real, that's the real solution. But, but the US want to spend money far and wide abroad, and not to the neighbors. And, and uh, and now now the, the the problem is coming home to root. Okay, uh, Suchi. So okay, Suchi, I'll, I'll, I'll stop Ted here. Ted and Dev and cannot wait to respond points. to you. Okay. That's it. I'm sorry. And thank you, David. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. But just as I said, uh, Ted told me that uh, he he will uh, be very like to uh, agree to uh, make some short well, response uh, to uh, Suchi's long uh, rebank. Uh, which is quite different from the mainstream opinion of the Taiwan government. <laughs> uh, thank you, Suji, for, for sharing those. I'm very much looking forward to reading your book on this topic and also uh, you know, grateful for your service, your public service uh, to the Taiwanese government, which no doubt informs your thinking on these issues. On the question of the weak kind of intellectual foundation of the U.S. strategy, uh, you know, I, ta I take that point. I I'm reminded of a story about an Irish man who is walking across Ireland on the road uh, to Leeds, the city of Leeds, and he asks someone for directions uh, on how to get to the city of Galway, which is all the way on the other side of the country. Uh, and the person says to him, well, I wouldn't start from here. I wouldn't start from where you are. Uh, you're in the wrong place. Uh, and I think you're right that US policy and strategy uh, has made a number of errors uh, over the years in sort of judging uh, the fundamental nature of the challenge uh, posed by China in the world and is now in a period of trying to adjust and recalibrate. Uh, and it's gonna take some time, I think, to get it right. I think another point worth mentioning here uh, is the challenge posed by multiple uh, conflicts in the world. So this is a, a description of the problem, not an excuse, I just want to be clear that I share your view um, on this issue. Uh, but when you look at uh, the amount of time uh, taken up by senior U.S. leaders focused on Russia and Ukraine, uh, now focused on uh, the crisis in the Middle East, uh, now people starting to get more worried about the Korean Peninsula. And again, these are all uh, allies, these are all partners of China. So who are China's uh, partners in the world? It's Russia, it's Iran, and it's North Korea. These are not a great set of friends uh, in terms of their governments and values and goals in the world. So China, I think, is pursuing a policy where it is seeking to cause uh, great conflict uh, and distraction for the United States uh, along the periphery uh, of Eastern Europe in the Middle East uh, the Korean Peninsula and, and possibly elsewhere. And the goal of that is to uh, continue to buy time uh, and to keep uh, questions of the Indo-Pacific uh, lower down on the focus of U.S. policymakers. So this is one of the fundamental challenges. Someone like Dave or my colleague Andy Macritus, who've had senior uh, U.S. government responsibilities, it's that the China question is always the next day's question, right? It's not at the top of the inbox, uh, and you can push it off till tomorrow. You know that it's the long-term problem, but it's not uh, today's problem. And uh, when you keep doing that, 
right? You sort of uh, re find yourself in situations uh, that you perhaps could have uh, better accounted for and controlled uh, to begin with. So this is just a description of how complicated I think it is in the world, but also that these other conflicts that we're seeing in Ukraine, uh, in the Middle East, Korean Peninsula, these are related to the problem uh, of how to manage U.S.-China relations, and they have a lot of implications for cross-strait relations. On the question of overreading China's ambition, uh, I think this is a question of how you assess uh, capabilities as opposed to uh, intent. And so these are different questions, and it's easy to see the capability, but it's hard to decipher the intent. So it's hard to say what Xi Jinping is thinking, right? But you can look at a description of what uh, China is doing. I, I agree with you that the One Belt, One Road is, is primarily uh, an economic activity that may not be as strategic, but things that do worry me about China uh, are its lack of transparency, uh, you know, in, in the military sphere. So uh, it's shipbuilding, it's outer space development, it's nuclear forces. These are things that do suggest from a capability standpoint uh, a broader global ambition than just uh, the territory uh, of the cross-strait uh, relation, for instance, or even extending beyond uh, the so-called uh, first island chain. So we don't know what the uh, intent is. We have to look at the capability, and the question is how do we create greater understanding uh, of the intent to prevent escalation or conflict? And here I think it's just important to remember that uh, the PRC has been very untransparent, huge lack of transparency uh, in terms of its intent uh, in the military sphere. And so uh, it does not publish a national security strategy. It does not you know, engage in a lot of openness and dialogue about its military activities. And again, this is the sort of thing, the lack of transparency combined with only an ability to assess the capability that I think creates a lot of increased worriness uh, in, the, in the United States and can lead to uh, uh, potential escalation uh, in the relationship. And I take your point on democracy. You know, uh, former UK uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill said democracy is the absolute worst form of government ever invented in the world, except every other form of government uh, that he had seen and witnessed, right? So uh, democracy is very messy. Democracy is prone to all sorts of uh, political disagreements. Some are rather fundamental and substantive uh, and can lead to conflict, right? But you need systems that are open, transparent, accountable, uh, and can work for regular people and citizens, right? And when democracies do that, right, that is a huge challenge uh, that it poses to uh, authoritarian governments around the world. So the challenge, I think, both for the United States and Taiwan is how to make democracy function, how to make it uh, work for people. Because no doubt the message uh, from across the strait uh, is that uh, democracy is not the right form um, of government. And look at all that we can do uh, in an authoritarian uh, system that lacks uh, those types of values. So we have to make democracy uh, work in this regard. And it's hard. It's just, it's going to be difficult um, and it's going to take time. Um, on the question of the will to fight, uh, you know, you're, you, people in this room are a better uh, judge than me on that question. I will just say that we spent uh, earlier this week uh, at a tabletop exercise organized uh, by Admiral Richard Chen, uh, Legislator Chen, uh, and the Taiwan Center for Security Studies that was really focused on building societal resiliency, reviewing a number of scenarios. Uh, again, not in the purpose of being provocative, but in the purpose of you know, creating a public awareness uh, that can lead to uh, strengthening of resilience in Taiwan and appreciation for the threat and creating a, a world where conflict is less likely, right? So I think a scenario where China assessed uh, that Taiwan people were less willing to resist, 
that it would not look like Ukraine, that it would look more like Hong Kong instead, that that would be a, a scenario that was more dangerous and more in unstable in cross-strait relations. So the challenge here is how do you build an awareness about the threat without overhyping it, right? And I think you're right to suggest that we don't want to be too alarmist because that might create the opposite unintended consequence of fueling the problem. But at the same time, uh, we can't be uh, so complacent about it or so worried about the Chinese reaction that it doesn't allow us uh, to be assertive. Uh, anyway, th this is a leadership challenge, so I appreciate your comments and thank you. Thank you, Tate. Uh, Dave, do you want to use up your remaining time to uh, respond to his comment? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what to say at this point. Yeah, no, I, I uh, uh, look, I guess the only thing, Ted, you didn't rebut was the last one, uh, but, but we were arguing the same thing. You know, I think the U.S. approach now, if you look at the Biden administration in full, you know, I, it's a little awkward having uh, someone who worked for a KMT government and not someone who worked for a DPP government. I, I'm not going to engage on your, on, on your views, uh, 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 assessments of the performance of of uh, uh, Tsai Ing-wen and her regularity of her press conferences. Joe Biden is not well known uh, for giving press conferences either, nor I would say is Li Qiang, uh, the, the, the Chinese premier. So I guess it's, it's uh, uh, she started a trend, uh, 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 <laughs> your president. Uh, but I think the Biden administration uh, has been pretty clear and, and uh, uh, maybe even on immigration that uh, uh, is, is taking your advice, Dr. Su, uh, by uh, starting a China policy by investing at home. You know, the, the Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is badly named, it really is investment in American uh, infrastructure, American competitiveness uh, in, in key areas. I mean, I think you are absolutely right in that. And I think Americans are recognizing uh, that uh, uh, you're absolutely right that uh, competing with China is, is primarily uh, and, and uh, sort of uh, first and foremost uh, will be a, a, an effort to, to uh, sort of remember what we did well to, to become uh, the dominant power after the end of the Second World War uh, and reinforce those, uh, those things. And then you know what, I, I think the comp it, that will, by reinforcing what we're able to do and, and our strengths will actually make things, I think it will, it will uh, lead to a calmer international situation rather than a, than a tenser one. Uh, because we will be more confident in, in our standing. Uh, and our standing, I think, uh, uh, it will uh, lead to confidence around the world. So, so uh, I felt delighted to be able to agree with you wholeheartedly in at least one of your four points. Okay, uh, I greatly appreciate the uh, very thoughtful remarks shared by our uh, speakers. And now before we open the floor, I would like to uh, ask only one question, uh, especially uh, to um, Ted and the Dave, because you are, um, you are from the United States. Uh, the question will go back to our topic, that is the U.S. Uh, grand strategy toward China. And my question is, what is the real intention of that strategy? Um, you mentioned that President Biden repeated again and again that the relation between China and uh, the America would be uh, competition without conflict. But the competition he mentioned is um, extreme competition, okay? So it is not just a normal competition to uh, just like a race in, uh, uh, the, the, on the field, it is a competition involved tariff, in trade, uh, military exercise, uh, and the Indo-Pacific um, strategy to contain China, and uh, the discussion of the core interest in Taiwan and the South China Sea, something like that. So now the problem is that many people, not only in Taiwan, but I think all around the world, were worried about the possibility uh, that if the competition is not managed well, yeah. then it could be um, led into a conflict, a military conflict between the two great powers with nuclear weapons. Um, 
that is something that Taiwanese people are uh, particularly concerned. So we sometimes we we heard people, I mean, uh, some experts in the United States arguing that maybe it's a good idea to uh, stimulate China and uh, drag it into a war in Taiwan, so that it will uh, its military strength will be serious weakened, and that therefore China will no longer become a threat to the United States. Well, it's kind of a um, theory, but um, we don't know whether or not this kind of thinking or option will be part of the American's great strategy towards China, uh, in addition to various kind of uh, extreme competition. Is military conflicts will be part of the strategy uh, in some case that uh, the, the states must uh, utilize. And on the other hand, uh, what will be the China's perspective of, of thinking about the American uh, intention? Uh, as you just uh, visited from Beijing, you mentioned that uh, they are not happy about uh, the Americans' current policy towards China. And uh, they also know that uh, um, the United States seems to uh, use Taiwan as a case to test the, the will or, or the determination of Beijing. Then would it be possible that Beijing decided to solve the Taiwan issue by force and uh, to test Americans' determination to defend Taiwan militarily? Um, as you said, the, the current leaders unlike the previous leadership in, um, Thai, in China, they do not want to pace the issue of unification to the next generation. And the economic situation in mainland China is not so good right now. So all the factors seem to uh, lead to the possibility that they will counter the US grand, uh, grand strategy by taking Taiwan by force. Uh, I, I don't know if you have the opportunity to talk with your Chinese uh, counterpart when you were in, uh, in Beijing about this possibility. So the question for you two gentlemen. I'll start with the easy part and, <laughs> and then let Ted answer the hard stuff. I don't know of anyone, any responsible person in Washington, in the United States, who's talking about provoking a Chinese aggression against Taiwan as a way of weakening China. I mean, there are lots of things I wake up worrying about, that's not one of them, that, that, uh, that a responsible foreign policymaker is going to sort of provoke, try to provoke a war as a way of, of uh, with, between, in the Straits uh, uh, to, to weaken China. The flip side of what motivates and, and what might lead Beijing to conclude that it needs to, it needs to use force against Taiwan, I mean, that's harder to answer because China is much less transparent, uh, I, uh, and and because ultimately it it depends on the decision of, of one individual, right? That, that Xi Jinping, uh, it's it's hard to know what any any individual thinks and, and what mo his motivations might be, and so I think our our job has to be uh, to think about uh, what, uh, as I s said at the end of my uh, remarks. Uh, what items are on Xi Jinping's to-do list when he wakes up every day, uh, and what can we do to uh, make sure that Taiwan doesn't end up on that list, both by, uh, by making it more difficult, uh, a more difficult prospect to deal with, and that includes things like uh, improving Taiwan's ability to defend itself, uh, to, to, uh, and aligning that capability with uh, Taiwan's assessment of, of how likely it is, uh, the, the will to fight. And I think it's a, a fine question. Uh, I, I think you're correct, Dr. Su, that uh, if Taiwanese are not willing to defend uh, Taiwan, then I think it's probably unreasonable to expect Americans to do so. Uh, and so uh, aligning Taiwan's defense posture uh, with, uh, uh, with its capabilities and, it, and, its, it, and its intentions uh, but then also uh, to think about how to re reassure Beijing uh, that neither Taipei nor Washington, uh, that, that Taipei and Washington understand uh, uh, the kinds of things that would put 
a military action high on the to-do list. Uh, and I, I think those are pretty clear. Uh, most, most of those are obvious, you know, the, the formal declaration of independence and some other steps uh, in that direction. But Ted? Well, I agree with uh, most of Ambassador Rank's uh, comments there, so I won't uh, re-echo them except just to say that, uh, you know, a conflict across strait would be disastrous, absolutely disastrous uh, for, for Taiwan, for China, for the United States, for the world, uh, and that no one that I know in Washington uh, would think that that would be uh, a worthwhile course of action. So we're united, I think, in the idea that we need to uh, prevent conflict. And so the debate is over what is the best way to prevent conflict. And so as the United States has defined this question of competition, I think that's a realistic assessment of where U.S.-China relations already have been uh, for a number of years. And so you're right that this competition uh, is uh, aggressive and occurring across almost every uh, field or domain of contest. Uh, whether it's territorial disputes, uh, sea, uh, land, air, uh, outer space, cyberspace. It seems as in every area where U.S.-China interaction is taking place that there is a competition for advantage. And uh, you know, that's a description of the world as it is. It's not uh, a value judgment uh, about which is this the right or wrong way. I think if the United States were to just draw back from any of those domains uh, that China would likely push forward uh, and see that uh, as a sign of weakness and seek to assert further uh, control in those areas. So the question then is how do you compete? How do you uh, resist efforts in those domains but not create a situation where there's miscalculation or escalation or inadvertent conflict? Uh, and I am concerned about this competition, uh, especially in the so-called gray zone, so uh, in areas below the threshold of sort of what you might consider like a military level uh, act of aggression. So uh, in the cyberspace domain, uh, there's a lot of risk. Uh, in naval activities, uh, in contested waters, there's a lot of risk that uh, a small action could have a disproportionate consequence. So I don't think the Cold War analogy is really accurate there. I think it's, it's more like a, uh, uh, a pre-World War I analogy, where a small incident, uh, an assassination attempt in the case of World War I, uh, could have a disproportionate uh, reaction around the world. So this is why engagement is important. So I think we share, uh, Dr. Suchi, this desire for uh, engagement, a desire to talk, to understand perspectives, uh, both in U.S.-Taiwan relations as well as U.S.-China relations, because facilitating that type of understanding uh, and people-to-people -people connection and appreciation for human dignity and our own uh, a desire for a better future, uh, I think is a, the best world uh, and the way to create a situation where Taiwan is not on uh, Dave Rank's uh, so-called to-do list, and I think that is a very helpful way uh, of framing that. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ted and Debbie. For, uh, thank you for your very uh, valuable uh, comment and the response to my question. Now I would like to open the floor, and uh, we have 30 minutes to go. Uh, everyone is welcome to raise your hand and uh, ask one question, and uh, please limit uh, your speech within maybe two minutes so that we can uh, commentate as many questions as possible, okay? Now, the floor is open. Anyone who want to ask a question? Okay, the gentleman over there first. American but 我觉得它已经变IP化了,谈到中国叫IP,中国问题。其实我要提醒你,如果你讲中国问题,对我来看,它就有美国问题。
你应该要先去提美国问题，在所有的媒体上面，我们来谈美国问题。OK， 那我们讲共共产党 （communism） 共产主义啊，这社会上有一堆的主义，每个国家有它的呃规范定的或它的 protocol。因为美国发展的早，西方世界发展的早，我们把民主、民主挂在口上，好像是一个非常美好的东西。我们谈共产、共产啊，它就是邪恶的东西。或许在过去，在历史上某一个阶段是这个样子，你可以这么比较、比较去描绘。但在时间的这个聚合上演变之下，它做了很多的调整。OK， 好。Gentlemen, thank you very much for your comment. I think it's a more、uh, of a nature of a comment. Instead I of question. So, but you you say you do not have questions. So, no, so I have、okay. uh, allow you two minutes to share your view.、Uh, excuse me. I think we need to shift to our next question.、Uh, the gentleman here. Okay, just a moment.、Um, thank you very much,、uh, Professor Su.、Um, I just have a quick question about the point about、uh, Taiwan's、uh, democracy.、Uh, like my Yale colleagues, I won't get into the,、uh, to the details of it, but I just have a question in terms of what, assuming you are, of course,、uh, correct that that it isn't as much of an ideal democracy. How should that affect American grand strategy, in your view? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I I,、uh, I I think the issue the the problem between U.S. and China is not about democracy and authoritarianism. It's about power, and、uh, the goal of U.S. grand strategy is to remain、uh, the number one、uh, power in the world as long as possible. And China is eager to share the podium, and、uh, I don't think it's、uh, that much about. It's 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 a game. It's a power game, and it's not much a、uh, the system game. So to highlight Taiwan as the good guy, and、uh, we have a miss,、uh, we have a Snow White in Taiwan, and we have a big bad、uh, queen or whatever in in China. And this, I think, dramatizes dramatizes the、uh, the relation, the cross relationship, and make compromise even less possible. Even less possible. So I I hope it, I hope the contest will be it would be less、uh, system related and more power related. If it's system related, it's a belief system related. It's almost not no compromise is possible. I'm the good guy, you're the bad guy. I'm the, I'm you know you're the devil, I'm the angel. But if it's about power and interest, then we can share. Then there must be room. Percentage you can divide percentage. U.S. get 80 percent, maybe a、uh, 70 percent, and you want 60 percent. You know, it's 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 possible. So so I think the, the heightening democracy,、uh, in especially in the wrong way, it it, it actually make the the the、uh, competition worse. Okay. Less, less susceptible to solution. Okay. Thank you. Our third question will be、uh, from、uh, Mr. Tan. And then、uh, Mr. Wang will be next, and the gentleman will be next.、Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Tian.、Uh, I am the Lieutenant General,、uh, retired from our Air Force.、Uh, because、uh, Ted, if I may, you have mentioned about the tabletop uh, exercise. Uh, I was there for past two days because I was the leader of the blue team.、Uh, I would like to share one information to you all because、uh, from first time the TTX one and、uh, the last. I think the last July 5th to 6th, and the TTX2 was yesterday, and the,、uh, because quite success, so we will write down a report and publish behalf of the Kuomintang,、uh, publish it、uh, before the our presidential inauguration. So we truly hope、uh, we will publish about the、uh, national uh, strategy uh, uh, report. For the whole country, for our old people, even for the、uh, regional countries that include the United States, so、uh, we truly hope、um, our government will listen to that. And also,、uh, we have a plan to have a TTX three, 
uh, probably uh, will hold that around after your your presidential inauguration and before the, your president uh, no after your presidential election and before the your presidential uh, uh, inauguration. So also we will uh, publish another one. Can hope to help our country. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Ten. Uh, so this area. thank you for your thank information. You. Do you have a question for the gentleman? <laughs> no. Okay. Then uh, Paul next. <laughs> Okay, my name is Paul Wong. I'm also is one of the co-sponsors for today's conference. But I have a question. It may not be related directly to the U.S. strategy toward China. But I want to talk about is one of the most popular in news recently everywhere in the world is, is TikTok. Okay. I know the bill is passed by the Congress. It's going to send to Senator, maybe Biden's desk for signature. I want to ask two of you. What will be the final answer to the TikTok issue? Because I know U.S. is very for freedom of speech, freedom of publication. Okay, then the question is, I'd like to find out from two of you, what will be the end of this? As, as far as I know, China will not willing to sell the shares. Okay, then what will be the end for this issue? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Uh, you are asking me to predict uh, uh, what, what the, <laughs> the U.S. Congress will do. I will not do that. But I, I will say, look, my problem with the TikTok legislation is not, uh, if you are a parent, uh, uh, you re recognize that uh, not just TikTok, but lots of social media, there are lots of concerns we should have about it. Uh, my problem with the TikTok legislation is that it, it, uh, it addresses only a very tiny slice of the concerns we ought to have about social media. Uh, and uh, uh, I think what the United States lacks at this point is any kind of data privacy uh, uh, structure to address the genuine concerns, uh, though the genuine concerns that there are about TikTok, which is uh, it, it uh, uh, allows governments, corporations, other entities, access to personal data that, that Americans uh, that ought to be able to protect. Uh, uh, TikTok and other social medias, uh, media uh, platforms are vulnerable to exploitation by people who don't have the interests of, of the American people in mind, and that's another uh, concern. But simply banning TikTok will not fix that, and I think you're right that, that uh, were the United States to compel the sale of TikTok, and were American courts to conclude that that was legally permissible to do under our Constitution, I don't think China would, uh, uh, would permit the sale, and so it would essentially cause the platform to collapse, and it would not solve the problem because there are other platforms out there that are equally vulnerable to the, the uh, issues I brought up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, a gentleman over there who raised your hand before this direction, are you still there? No, then I will move it to the young, uh, stu uh, young gentleman, yes, just in front of me. Please. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Zhang. I'm going, I'm going to ask one question and not going to talk about any theories, but instead some life experience. Um, uh, Mr. Wittenstein and Mr. Rank, uh, you both talk about are your goal to get Taiwan erased from Xi Jinping's to-do list, but you didn't explain much about how or any, like, many or some methods that you're going to, uh, may maybe that you've observed from. So would you explain more about, like, how to get Taiwan get erased from uh, Xi Jinping's to-do list? Um, uh, from my perspective, it's, it's nearly impossible. And it's not just on Xi Jinping's uh, to-do list. It's almost on every Chinese leader's to-do list. And however, luckily, from our life experience, um, we pro procrastinate. Uh, like, for example, I'm going to be, there's um, one example from being a billionaire on my to-do list, but maybe that's not going to happen. So would you explain more, like, how can we, uh, to, to, to get Taiwan to, maybe um, expand the timeline, or maybe let Xi Jinping procrastinate, or, or maybe just slow down a little bit um, to get Taiwan into any trouble. Thank you. Okay. Sure, thanks. Good question. Uh, I, uh, it is an art, not a science. Uh, but uh, you know, for, for 40 years, we have managed, I think one of the real successes of US diplomacy, and not just the United States, but has, managed, has been managing uh, what we knew at the, at the uh, start of US-PRC relations would be a, a very difficult issue, right? Which is, we had a fundamental disagreement about, about 
the status of Taiwan. Uh, and the way to keep that off, I mean, we had structures in place that have become, uh, uh, you know, the, what sort of the badly defined status quo, but how, the, how Beijing, how Washington, and how Taipei uh, handled questions of the relationship. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I look at how to, how to put Taiwan on, uh, uh, on Xi Jinping's to-do list is to have the American Speaker of the House uh, fly to the island, right? Then, then Beijing, then Xi Jinping has to respond to that in some way. Uh, uh, you know, there, I've heard proposals of changing the name of Taiwan's representative office from the Taipei Economic and Commercial Relations Office to the Taiwan Representative Office in Washington to say, to, to demonstrate that it's not about Taipei, it's about, about Taiwan. I understand the sentiment behind that, but I think that's the kind of thing that would put the issue, that would force Beijing to make some kind of response. So, I mean, there are, there's a long list of those things, but they are the things that, that are clear, uh, clearly go beyond uh, 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 what Beijing has come to expect in the relationship, uh, and that don't, fundamentally uh, add to Taiwan's ability to maintain the status that it has now. So there's some things that we're going to have to do. That sometimes, uh, uh, you know, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan, clearly Beijing is unhappy with them, but those add to Taiwan's ability uh, to, uh, to complicate the equation of whether this goes on the to-do list. Well, I agree that all that Dave just said, uh, I'll just add that, uh, you know, there's a difference between sort of to do or a wish list versus uh, to do today or to do tomorrow, right? So, uh, you know, part of the U.S. strategy, I think, is, uh, you know, not today, right? So uh, to wake up and to not want to do anything rash uh, today. Uh, and the goal of, of the TTX exercise that was mentioned before is to sort of how to build out the timeline, uh, you know, beyond uh, today to next month or next year, or, right? So there's ways to sort of think about this question uh, and anything that would sort of accelerate the time pressure that would create an instigation, I think, is not the right way to have uh, this question resolved. So, you know, we have, it's been over 50 years since Dr. Kissinger's first visits to China and the establishment of U.S.-China ties, and the one-China policy has, you know, lasted extraordinarily long for a democracies that have all of these problems that we've talked about today. Uh, to have a 50-year policy is rather extraordinary. So this is not something that I think should be taken lightly. And it's taken, you know, three communiques, six assurances, two understandings, a Taiwan Relations Act, right? All of these things have been part uh, of trying to define the policy, and there will be bumps in the road, but if we can keep the fundamental concepts intact and not try to rock the boat, I think we're uh, best positioned for the future. Thank you very much. The next question will go to the gentleman, uh, yes, just uh, after, uh, behind the one who uh, raised the question previous. And thank you all for the sharing. I have a question for Ted specifically. So yeah, as, as Ted, your response to Dr. Su's remarks about the first point, which is the intellectual foundation, you lay out the concern about the multiple conflict happening about the U Ukraine and uh, Russia and about the North Korea, and uh, mostly it's about the concern of the ally selection strategy of China, because those countries are the the the, the philosophy or, or, or the attitude towards those countries are not uh, positive. But, but for me, I think that those countries like North Korea, Russia, or uh, Afghanistan, those are the neighbors of China. So it, I found it like nature for them to work with them. So my question is that, so for now, how, how, uh, how the Chinese government can enhance the trust in terms of the ally strategy, because like the U Europe or the U.S. are mainly like in a competition a position against China. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think you're right to raise that 
China has a lot of historical reasons and for its relationships with, with Russia, with North Korea, with uh, Iran, was the one that I had mentioned uh, in respect to the Middle East. Uh, these are not uh, partners of the United States. These are countries that actually have a much more con conflicting and aggressive relationship with the United States than the United States enjoys with China. Uh, and so I think this is part of what has fueled uh, a pretty dramatic mistrust uh, in the United States and a decline uh, in Chinese perceptions in America, uh, especially in Europe with respect to Ukraine. So the Ukraine war uh, and China's association with Mr. Putin has dramatically increased uh, European concerns about China uh, in a way that did not exist before the conflict. And so when you discuss this issue in Beijing, actually I think there's a recognition that this has been uh, a blight for China, uh, that uh, the guilt by association of being a partner or a partner or no limits partner uh, with the Russian state has really uh, created a lot of concern. So again, if you're asking uh, you know, ways that China could demonstrate greater trust or willingness, yeah, I think you know, looking at the conflict of Ukraine, willing to put uh, pressure on Russia, not being an economic safety valve for Russian sanctions or not uh, giving weapons uh, to Russia, things that would fuel the conflict. Uh, this is an area where you know, goodwill, I think, could be demonstrated. Uh, the same for the Korean Peninsula and the Middle East. So if China is perceived in the world as seeking to diffuse conflict and not foment it or not allow its partners who it enjoys strong foreign policy relations to not support those countries when they engage in these actions, I think those are the sorts of things that would uh, be areas that the United States and China would be, uh, would be, could potentially cooperate and it would be welcomed. So those are just a few thoughts on the question. I'm not saying that China necessarily supports particular conflicts in the world or tries to create them, right? I, the point, though, is that if you look at who their friends are in the world, yes, some of them are neighbors, uh, but uh, the friends are not friends of the United States. And I think this is part of how the United States has viewed this conflict through the lens of multiple conflicts. And so this is a one way to judge uh, China's intentions from the perspective of, of the U.S. policy community. Okay, thank you. The gentleman over there, please use the microphone near you. Thank you. The question is, why do the USA want to compete against China in the first place? Because when we are talking about strategy, we usually start by talking about the strategic goal or the intention. And as we know that a lot of Chinese interpret the, uh, the American intention is to put down China and remain the most powerful country in the world and to pr protect its uh, interest. But we also know that the, uh, a long time tradition of American diplomacy is altruism. Uh, since the early 20th century that American people think that spreading the democracy all over the world is good for the human being. Is, so is that still true or do we only think about your interest at this moment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't think there's a conflict between uh, supporting democracy uh, outside of the United States and, and advancing U.S. interests. I mean, American foreign policy has generally thought that they, they are aligned, that, it, that uh, uh, advancing democracies elsewhere uh, has been in our interest. I, but look, why compete with China? I think. Uh, what we're seeing, and, and the previous question was about conflict in Russia and, and the Middle East and, and North Korea. Uh, I, I think what we're witnessing is the uh, 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 destabilization of the post-Second World War order that, you know, for 70 plus years, I can't do the math, but it's been many years, uh, the, you know, the structures uh, that the United States largely with, uh, 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 was responsible for putting in place uh, maintained the peace, created an environment in which uh, uh, the world was relatively stable, even during the Cold War. Uh, American interests, uh, American could, could advance its economic and other interests, and those largely benefited the rest of the world. And now we're seeing 
uh, that, that that system is breaking down. It's breaking down because China's rising. It's breaking down because, frankly, some bad policy decisions by the United States. I would say exhaustion within the uh, within uh, American domestic, uh, within you know the American system itself, uh, uh, with whatever the uh, the outside view of, of American uh, uh, behavior abroad is, uh, there is some uh, some considerable discontent with the costs that the United States has borne again lar uh, in no small part because of policy mistakes, uh, but. But you know, U.S. policy. I, I think most of American policymakers are concerned that uh, we know the, situ the, the, uh, uh, the situation we now have, and whatever its problems, it is likely preferable to whatever comes next. And particularly the moment between one point of relatively relative stability, which we are, I think, leaving, and whenever that the, the global system stabilizes again. Uh, in a new structure, that it is going to be highly destabilizing. It's going to be bad for American interests, and I think it's going to be bad for uh, the interests of a lot of other places in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dave. The question come, come back to the gentleman. Pat, uh, uh, nice please. seeing you again in Taipei. Uh, I would like to echo Professor Suchi's point. The United States does need some more deliberate thinking, discussion, or even debating on your grand strategy on China. For example, the question I would like to ask to our friends from the uh, United States, does your grand strategy have this option that the United States could lose its hegemony globally or lose its dominance in the Indo-Pacific? And if that's the case, what's your plan B like if China breaks through from the island chain and go to has much, much more impact uh, in the Western Pacific for Taiwan. Um, thank you for that question. I, I think this question of uh, strength or relative strength or hegemony or decline, uh, this is just a, a facet of the international system. Uh, you know, Presidents Biden and Xi have stated quite clearly that they both believe uh, that the world is big enough uh, for both of these uh, great nations and peoples and cultures uh, and to exist, right? So uh, I don't view this as a question of stopping uh, one country's advancement. I think it's more a question of being uh, very clear and straightforward about uh, what elements of, of advancement by, might be most concerning. So just as an example, like I, would, I do not support just strangling China's economy across all areas, right? That, you know, that what I was saying about the economic decline in China and what we recently experienced in Beijing, I, I do not necessarily view that as very positive, right? A situation where China's economy uh, took a downturn or collapsed would not be good for the United States or Taiwan and would not be one that I would be uh, supportive of, right? So what I am saying is uh, we need to be supportive uh, of what is constructive, what is helpful uh, in terms of both of these great nations uh, and their role in the world. So I, I'm hard pressed to think of any global challenge that won't require some form of cooperation between the United States and China uh, to address. So climate change being a, a key one, which we haven't talked about. Uh, preventing another global pandemic uh, is another, right? So there are huge challenges in the world where the United States and China will need to cooperate. There are huge challenges in the world where our interests uh, do not align and the relationship is uh, competitive, sometimes very competitive, as we discussed, sometimes very aggressively competitive. Um, and uh, I think that's okay. You know, I think we just have to be realistic about where mm. the areas of disagreement are mm. and just be clear-eyed about it. And so the challenge here is to how to structure the competitive relationship. Uh, and to make sure that not every win is a loss and not every uh, issue is a zero-sum issue. Uh, there might be some that are, and again, the challenge there is to ensure that in areas that are potentially zero-sum, that that conflict doesn't spill over or escalate uh, into destroying other areas of potential progress and cooperation. So, you know, this is a leadership challenge. Uh, there's no one answer to it, but I think a, a situation where both countries were very aggressively engaged on trying to structure a bilateral relationship and not going back to where we were a year ago of 
no talking or interaction, that would be a, a better situation if we were not engaged, totally divided, totally decoupled, I think the prospect uh, of conflict is higher. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that through uh, restarting and re-engaging and restructuring the relationship, we can <laughs> arrive in a better place uh, and prevent any misunderstandings. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, our last opportunity of question goes to the lady over there. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. I just have a quick question. So you had mentioned that um, there's a lot less U.S. students currently in China. You said there were 350. I was wondering if you think that could partly be because of the slightly um, xenophobic rhetoric in like the U.S. government, especially on the right, and how we could perhaps ameliorate that and encourage East-West conversation. And um, my second question is kind of, um, off of Professor Jiang's question earlier about how a conflict in Taiwan could perhaps help the U.S. since it would weaken China. And I know that you had said that the U.S. would never intentionally provoke such a conflict as it would be disastrous. But I was wondering, that, especially given the U.S.'s history and like, you know, Arab Spring and in meddling in other international conflicts, that if such a conflict were to be provoked by China and the Taiwanese people would rather have peace, if the U.S. would not still send military and not ensure peace and rather um, send military over in order to achieve an end that might benefit the U.S. Um, in total. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> look, when I, I happened to be the head of the embassy at the uh, end of the Obama administration, and it was even it was clear then that the number of American students going to the People's Republic to study uh, was dropping fairly significantly. So there's a secular trend. Uh, it had dropped from something like 15,000 at, at its peak to a little over 10,000 uh, uh, by 2016, 2017. So, so uh, I think there are a number of reasons that, that contributed to that. And that really predates a lot of the anti-Asian rhetoric uh, that, or, or at least the most virulent anti-Asian rhetoric in the US. So the trend was already there. I think it wasn't helped by uh, uh, publicity, a lot of it earned by China about the bad uh, 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 air pollution and, and environmental situation there, uh, not helped by a really, at times, uh, difficult academic environment if you're an American student there, not helped by uh, a number of other things. Uh, and then, of course, you have the pandemic, which led to the collapse in, in the number of students. It uh, hasn't bounced back because it's still expensive. It's hard to get a plane ticket. Uh, but also by just the fact that if you are, like I was 30 years ago, uh, uh, graduating with an undergraduate degree, trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life, and you're looking around and thinking, where are the financial opportunities? I came to Taiwan to study because I thought uh, in, in the mid-'80s that China would be uh, was, was an uh, up-and-coming market, and I, I guessed that right. But now a lot of students look around and, and look at what's going on in China, and that's not the conclusion. They're looking at other places. Uh, and I think that feeds into it quite a bit. Uh, 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 and, and, but I'm not denying the, the, poss you know, the, the uh, factor of, of uh, you know, anti, anti general anti-China uh, sentiment in the United States and anti-Asian rhetoric. Uh, it certainly has to feed in to some extent. Although I will note, it, note that I teach a class on Korea, and Korea is really hot right now. Pe the number of people, so it's not anti-Asian rhetoric. It's, uh, you know, a lot of people are studying Korean language uh, because of, I think, really successful uh, uh, Korean soft power uh, and very uh, uh, clearly directed from the government. Mm. Uh, tough uh, one to you, Ted. Well, I, the last thing on the language I would just say is that a lot of uh, students are studying Chinese language here now in Taiwan. So uh, many of our Yale students, as an example, are, are having language study in Taiwan. The number of Americans now in Taiwan uh, studying Chinese language uh, has dramatically increased. Uh, so I don't think it's an anti-Asian uh, question as more maybe a general concern uh, about China, their zero COVID policy, certain steps they're taking. Uh, and I think this is an opportunity for Taiwan. It's an opportunity for the great work that the Fairwinds Foundation does. There are a lot more Americans here now uh, than there used to be. And I hope they'll gain uh, a greater appreciation for Taiwanese uh, history and culture and society, just as my own students have done here in a very small amount over the last four days. The United States policy, uh, you know, with respect to Taiwan is the one China 
policy. So uh, that's to not support Taiwan uh, independence uh, and to oppose all efforts to unilaterally alter the status quo. So you're raising a, a hypothetical scenario where uh, maybe there was an effort to unilaterally alter the status quo, but it didn't appear that it was necessarily unilateral, as in both countries would agree on some resolution. Uh, you know, I think these are case by case questions. Uh, I think the principle, though, is that uh, the United States uh, will resist efforts to have either side uh, on this question kind of impose uh, a resolution on the other, right? And so the goal of the One China policy is to buy time, to have this not be uh, forcefully addressed by either country. Uh, and both countries benefit by having this unaddressed and being ambiguous enough that they can interpret the One China policy uh, in their own systems and, and cultures and histories. And so it is notable that this One China policy has lasted so long. So I'm hopeful we wouldn't arrive at a point where there'd have to be a question about whether one country was unilaterally altering. Right? Because once you got to that point, right, uh, I think we'd be in a very bad place regardless of the outcome of that conflict. So even the existence of a conflict or if a conflict seemed very likely, these would have uh, disastrous economic uh, consequences worldwide. Uh, given the integrated nature uh, of our economies. So we need to prevent that. Uh, I think we do need to ensure uh, that Taiwan has an ability to defend itself, right? So the United States under the Taiwan Relations Act does provide defensive support to Taiwan. Uh, these weapons are not designed to be used to foment the conflict. They're designed to keep the peace. And so the extent to which there was a huge imbalance that might potentially create a riskier scenario where conflict was more likely and not less likely. So this is how I think people think about the question. There's no right answer to it, except to say that uh, we want to buy time, yes. right? And the purpose of me uh, bringing my students here to Taiwan is to understand, to engage with Dr. Su Chi, to mm -hmm. engage with Premier Jiang, to engage with all of you, and to learn uh, about Taiwan history, culture, society, and I think those greater understandings uh, can lead to a more peaceful world. So thank you so much for hosting well, Thank us. you so much for your final conclusion. Um, due to the limit of time, I'm sorry that we cannot take more questions. And um, at the final um, stage of the forum, I would like to thank our three distinguished speakers for your thought, for sharing. I also want to thank uh, KTL, KTD Foundation again for uh, co-hosting the event. And uh, uh, Jason is over there. I want to thank you for connecting uh, the Yale Jason, Jackson School. Jason, definitely. Jason Shi, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you so yep. much. Absolutely. And I think the forum is a very good example of how engagement and the dialogue uh, can be and um, to uh, express its uh, positive effect. So I look forward to more uh, co cooperation between the Fair Winter Foundation and uh, the uh, Jackson School in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you everyone for you sparing your time for our event today. Don't forget to follow our page on Facebook and at Fair Winds Foundations online. And the members of Yale student delegation and the members of the Fair Wind Leadership Program, please go on the stage and take a group photo.